Welcome, friends, to the 8 Push Dig, where we will build together a critical understanding of U.S. history through analyzing the processes of change. This week, our focus is to examine certain aspects of life and society in the 13 colonies. Even though geographically the colonies were a long ocean trip away from England, it's important to remember the transatlantic connections in this period. The colonists viewed themselves as subjects within the British Empire, not as Americans. Their identities can be seen in four ways, as being British, as being a resident of a specific British colony, a Virginian from Virginia, for example, the church denomination they belonged to, and finally, with the emergence of the chattel slavery system that ensnared African people, the new conception of colonists' whiteness. In the early 18th century, we can't really see any common colonial identity uniting colonists from, say, Rhode Island and South Carolina. But by the 1760s, these notions of an American identity, distinct from a British identity, began to slowly emerge. One example of a transatlantic exchange between England and the colonies would be the Great Awakening, an evangelical religious movement that did begin in Britain, but spread like wildfire across the colonies. This religious revival movement lit religious obsession in an already religiously obsessed society. But the key here is the introduction of evangelism, or the belief that one needs to be born again in the church. These new evangelical preachers would tour the colonies, attracting mass crowds at each of their outdoor sermons. The thing here to note is that these Great Awakening preachers were attracting people away from their previous churches and into this new movement. This caused a rift in church membership. There were the old light churches, those popular before the Great Awakening, and there were the new light churches, the evangelical ones. The evangelical churches were even more culturally conservative than the old churches. But was, what was most important about the new Great Awakening churches were that it led many colonists to question old forms of church authority. Some historians believe this questioning of authority would be extended in the next generation of colonists and their questioning of political authority. If the Great Awakening was the most important transatlantic exchange amongst the masses of common and working peoples, the ideas of the Enlightenment was a transatlantic exchange that mattered most to the colonial elite. Names we will discuss later, like Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and Alexander Hamilton. The political philosophies expressed in these Enlightenment texts influenced the next generation of political leaders in the colonies. Ideas such as natural rights and the social contract between the government and the people began to be discussed in elite circles. In terms of economic transatlantic exchange, it's important to understand the system of mercantilism that was put in place by the English government. Mercantile capitalism was the system to produce wealth in the form of commodities in the colonies and ensure that these commodities go directly to England to enrich England and its companies involved in the exchange. Thus, the colonies were never meant to develop their own export economy independent of England. Instead, the colonies were by design meant to accumulate wealth for England. This was backed by parliamentary law, the so-called Navigation Acts, which mandated that colonial producers only sold their goods to English merchants using English ships. The goods as raw materials would be manufactured in England and then sold back to the colonies and to European markets. However, because of the distance between England and its colonies, laws like the Navigation Acts were difficult to enforce. There was plenty of smuggling going on back then. The goods that made mercantile capitalism so profitable for colonial and English merchants were mainly produced through enslaved labor. Like other European empires in the Americas that participated in the Atlantic slave trade, the English colonies developed a system of slavery that reflected specific economic, demographic, and geographic characteristics of those colonies. It's important to understand that slavery existed in all 13 colonies because no colony had any law prohibiting it. Equally important is to understand that slavery looked different in form, in number, and in practice in the different colonial regions. The number of slaves who worked on New England farms was minuscule. However, slaves could be found working in seaports like Boston, loading and unloading ships. 
And it was in these New England seaports where one could find the center of the lucrative slave shipbuilding industry. In southern colonies, the plantation system was run from stolen labor of masses and masses of, un of enslaved men and women on cash crop plantations. In the middle colonies, where two of the busiest colonial ports were, New York City and Philadelphia, enslaved people could be found doing any number of different forms of enslaved labor. The colonies did not just develop an economy that had slaves. The colonies developed a slave economy. Likewise, especially in southern colonies where the numbers of enslaved people were so much higher, it was not a colony with slaves, rather a slave society. Laws were created to protect the institution of slavery and to ensure it would continue onward and reproduce itself. Newspapers and media supported this system, indoctrinating colonists into believing racism and slavery were both justified, natural even. Even the different colonial churches played a major role in this mass indoctrination. So let's reflect on some change then during this colonial time period. Here are three things that stand out to me as being very key. First, the transatlantic exchange of printed materials kept colonists feeling connected to their British identity. The high rate of literacy in the colonies contributed to the long distance distribution of newspapers and magazines across the colonies. And so this print culture and this literacy culture will be very key in the next generation where we start to see people trying to build um, connections between the different colonial regions, which will be so key during the American Revolutionary time period. And finally, the shift away from temporary white indentured servants to a permanent black enslavement was facilitated and supported by legal means, by religious means, and also by social means. And that's about it for right now. Thank you.